Welcome to the Concept 101 podcast. My name is Daniel. Jules. Stefan. We are three concept artists currently working in the film and games industry, as well as the organizers of the Concept 101 event in London. And today we're going to each be bringing our own subjects to the table, as we always do, and having a little chat and hopefully some entertainment for you while you sit on a toilet or whatever you do when you listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Paint, hopefully. I hope you sit on the toilet. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Everyone, stand up. (laughs) Get in your bathroom. Even Uh, if you're shitting right now, stand up. (laughs) (laughs) Leave the bathroom, come back, (laughs) resume. Um, So yeah, today uh, we're going to be talking about our own different subjects. And I think I'm starting off. Uh, So I have like a fairly broad conversation I think to have today, um, which hopefully will be interesting. But I want to talk about, we've spoken a lot uh, many, many times about kit bash and kind of how you don't want to allow it to lead what you do in your design. But something we haven't spoken about is allowing programs and tools to lead your design and thought process when you're making stuff. So just contextually, what I've noticed over the years of like, you know, looking at student portfolios and stuff is that loads of people over the last, let's say like five or six years have done an amazing job of integrating 3D into their process, which is great to see. Um, when we've spoken about before, like when we were students, how we were like, no, I'll never fucking do that. And now we all do it. Um, But the kind of catch 22 of integrating so much 3D into your process is that I've noticed many, many students allow the 3D to kind of reorient what they're doing and they let the 3D lead them rather than leading the tool itself. Uh, So I guess I just want to ask you, do you guys have any experience with these things? Or have you seen any portfolios which have this problem? And like, what are your thoughts on it? Um, yeah, I, I would definitely in many portfolios you see that some people are relying too much on 3D or like it sometimes it really feels like there hasn't been enough work done on top of the 3D renders to mm-hmm. truly uh, like make it feel unique. You know, I feel like the Blender look or like the, the clean 3D look, which yeah. is by default not realistic because of how clean everything and how sharp everything is, yeah. uh, is definitely something that we can see a lot. Uh, similar to other softwares where, you know, like 3D code, I think has a clear identity yeah, um, and it tends to to look like it's been on 3D code. Uh, for example, but 3D code, usually people that use it tend to be, to do nice work. <laughs> I think that's the, the what, I'm, what I'm, I think what I'm trying to say is like, if you're a good designer and you're using 3D code to get your design further, mm-hmm. then what you're doing is you're usually starting with a sketch and then you are refining that sketch and then you're going, okay, I'm going to refine this further by bringing it into 3D and you use the tool to kind of visualize this idea in three dimensions and blah 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 i think the problem that i've seen in a lot of portfolios is that people start with the 3d and you know Mm. for example in 3d coat there's a certain set of tools that you can use like the cut tool the fact that it's voxel sculpting that lends itself to if you're not trying to design too much you're just going to create like a lot of very 45 degree cut up spaceships with random bits of sculpting in between and blah, blah blah in the same way if you're using zbrush all day and you want to do a hard surface design in there you might end up using a lot of like selection masks and layer effects over everything and so you end up with this like super layered high density nothingness really um same as in blender like you have polygonal modeling there so do if you don't know how to really use it are you going to end up with just like a shit ton of hard angles everywhere boxes same with plasticity like all these things Mm. i think what i've noticed is pretty much that like each of these programs have like you said a specific visual style but that people let that visual style decide what they're making Mm -hmm. rather than trying to force the tool to make what they want it to make i think it's about picking the right tool for the right tasks like i the way i use zbrush for example i know i can if I want to design a spaceship, I know I can do better work personally with Blender than with ZBrush. Uh, also because I tend to use ZBrush for organic stuff. Mm-hmm. So if I do want to do an organic spaceship, I'm going to go to ZBrush because I know that it's going to give me, with the way I use it, organic shapes or a more organic feel. Um, if you ask me to to do a, a creature in, in Blender, I'll be like, well, really? Like, it sounds a bit like like losing my time doing all <laughs> everything in Blender or it's going to look like much more blocky or way less... I mean, especially the way I use Blender again, because I don't really sculpt in Blender because I never learned it. Um, so, yeah, I think the way I see that is more choosing the tool for the right task. But some people, I guess, they just know one tool. And I think that's when you you, you, you mentioned that it really gets the look of the tool. I mean, I, I only know Blender and Gravity Sketch, essentially. 
um, I like to think that my work doesn't just look like gravity sketch blender like. Um, don't know. But yeah, I, I'm not talking about you. I'm know. talking about people who have like, for example, I see many many spaceships that students design in 3D coat. And it's specifically built using, like, I can tell the exact processes that they've used to get to that totally. end result. Yeah. I think that's the issue is, like, you often, like, the way that you might use Blender, Stefan, is not inherently wrapped up with the confines of, let's say, the easiest things to do in that program, right? You know the program pretty well. And so when you do it, you're designing, like, for example, a, a house, and then you're building that house in a very specific way that emulates your existing design rather than designing in Blender mm -hmm. and allowing the easy options to yeah. shape yeah. what your design is. What, 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 what you're saying is almost like using a software for its default usage, for the most obvious usage. Like, sure. like the, the, the example of a spaceship for 3D code is because, I mean, I did that myself. I used to have a project in my portfolio, which was spaceships in 3D code, and I can... I mean, it's not here anymore, but if you would see it, you'd be like, yes, yeah, this, this thing, exactly, you know? <laughs> and uh, like same, you know, if you use Grease Pencil in Blender to design spaceships, they're going to also have a specific look from Grease Pencil. Um, like most of the time when you see a creature, or, you know, maybe it's also the ability to see those different styles from softwares, maybe it also comes from the experience of seeing those styles and of seeing those projects, because I'm not sure everyone will see that. Or would... Yeah, but I think if you... Uh, yeah, I mean, Stefan, you can talk, sir. Um, I would say I think you are right. I think not everyone. I think when you are a student, you don't. You just go, wow, wow, it's a cool spaceship, and you don't really care mm -hmm. whether it's like building three D code or anything, uh, because you find that like, oh, it's so f so such a nice fidelity of detail or something. But I I I think at the end it comes down of the process that's before of what you do before you go into the 3D software, mm -hmm. of having a vision of what you want mm -hmm. uh, and like a specific... But here's the question is like, okay, so yes, you can have like a closer to finish design before you go or like a pretty good sketch uh, and then you go into Blender or whatever you choose your tool to be. Um, how do you still like stay creative within 3D? Or is there a world where you should just be and be creative and start with 3D right away? Or, you know, maybe you are very, very good or... Mm. Well, I think it depends what situation you're in. Like, I'm sure there's okay. been plenty of designs that I've done for movies where I've just started in 3D because I haven't had time to do a sketch. I know I need to create an asset. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, when I create, although I have, like we've discussed before, like the different tools we all use, and I have a lot of programs at my disposal that I know how to use in different ways. Like, I am not going to go into ZBrush and start modeling whatever I need to model and then go, oh, well, the move tool's pretty good in here and just start throwing the move tool about to distort the shape and be like, well, there's a new design. Like, I think that's that's where the problem is. Is like, just because a tool is available to you, mm. like you need to choose what you're doing with it rather than letting it lead you. It's yeah. like if you use Photoshop a lot, right? Um, even in a program like Photoshop, which obviously we mainly use for painting, you could spend the whole time using Photoshop uh, just using like filter layers and then like smacking overlays over that mm. and then doing color dodge on top of it and like over fine edges yeah like you're o you don't want to overuse a piece of software you want to know the limitations of it you want to know the limitations of what you should be able to do with it and then not go too far I think that's the thing right I think one of the way maybe to avoid it in Blender even what I feel like I've seen in your work um, is to start with like a very good block out and start with a block out that kind of already works on the block out stage yeah. and then progressively move towards even if you start in 3D you would you would yeah you start with like a block out of the shapes and once the shapes work then you work your way towards the secondary detail and then to like the you know tertiary detail and like detail detail pass you know and that way you are at least building something off of a certain workflow rather than just like having superly detailed model right away, let's say somehow. Like mm -hmm. you, you use a lot of alphas or something, and then you're you know, you're not paying attention to the actual like process. It's definitely about planning before doing something and knowing your tools. Because you know, I think if you know Blender well or if you know ZBrush well, if if someone gives you a sketch of a spaceship, you can probably get end up with the same results using both software, I, I think that's the if point, you know them yeah. well, yeah. you know? But this 
same, you know, if you ask me to design a creature, let's say, yeah. and you give me a sketch at the start, which I know I have to design this, and I can use whatever software I want, yeah. or you or you force me to use certain res, uh, softwares, once I become, uh, once, once I know a software enough, yeah. I'll be able to get the same results for any softwares. Um, but I guess the trap is to allow yourself to n- know where you're going before starting and or if you know that you don't you want directly to go to design then choose software that allows you the freedom to do so that's why i think vr is so good to jump directly into 3d because vr has so much freedom into what you can get to f- uh, in 3d fast you know mm. uh, because you can it's almost vr is almost like sketching in 3d especially if you use like um, gravity sketch gravity sketch or a, a medium for me as well i really like it and it's that's why if I do have to jump in free directly, I would choose this software because I know there's no, f- there's very little friction, limitation, yeah, to what I want to know. Because yeah, of course, designing straight in Blender, I mean, I would be, I, I my, I know for a fact my designs will be worse. Yeah, I I think it's similar to some advice I got when I used to do a lot more traditional painting, which was I had this really wonderful teacher who taught me how to do oils, watercolors, gouache, everything, and. He showed me three paintings he had done of the same subject matter, and they all looked functionally identical. And what he told me was, he was like, so this one's watercolor, this one's oils, and this one's gouache. Mm. And he's like, but they all look the same. He said, I know that there's like an objective level of quality I need to reach to use these tools effectively. And then once I can do that, then I can start saying to myself like, okay, well, it's watercolor, so I can be a little bit more painterly with this. It's gouache, so I can be a little bit more... um, opaque and almost like industrial and graphic designing with the way I lay down my shapes. It's oils, so I can have more blending. But if you can't use all of them effectively to reach a similar result, then you're stuck with, yeah, like the most obvious use cases of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you're using um, Gravity Sketch, like you were saying, to make stuff, I think you you don't want to be in a position where all you can make in Gravity Sketch is kind of like one thing. Like push comes to shove, you should functionally understand how to do something else in there right even if it's not going to be as good you should Mm -hmm. still understand Mm -hmm. it you need to know the tools and the only maybe caveat to that is that i guess to an extent you can get around it just by knowing a lot of tools Mm -hmm. uh in which case like i know like like i don't know like seven or eight different 3d programs Mm -hmm. at this point and i just use them all for very specific things yeah but that allows me to not be led by the 3D because I'm already doing my designs in 2D and then I'm choosing the appropriate tool to do the job. Exactly, like each task is gonna get you, like each each software is gonna allow you to do something better, you just switch. Like something, a great example of actually, because I was saying about uh, Adobe Medium, is great for me as a start, yeah. but I noticed recently I tried to make assets ready directly in Medium, they all looked blobby, mm. you know, because I'm not spending too much time in there, I'm doing it very dirty quickly. And it just ends up looking a bit blobby, you know, because that's, I guess, the exact example of what you were saying that the look because of the software or yeah. because of my limited skills in the software. And that's why I would almost always now, if I know I want to do something detailed in there, yeah. I would bring it to ZBrush. And in ZBrush, I know I'm going to have a second pass on refining the design, but I'm going to be faster and it's going to be easier for me to design the first pass in Medium. Yeah. I suppose as well, if you're listening to this and you're going like, well, luckily I don't have that problem, right? Um, I would say draw out a design and see if you can do it in your program of choice. Like draw out something that you're not that used to doing. If you have a lot of spaceships in your portfolio, draw out a wooden horse and cart carriage and then see, hey, can you actually model this? Like how far do your skills actually extend in this program? Um, because then you might that might completely recontextualize all of the other work that you have, and you might be able to look at that and go, oh, shit, yeah, actually, I was making all these design choices because of XYZ tool that I know how to use, rather than because it's the right choice. Yeah, yeah, or because it's your, it's like the, the thing you know you can do easily. Yeah. You know, so like you're always going to do like spaceships with wings because you just figured out how to make a perfect wing in ZBrush or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, totally. Are you always going to throw greebles all over all of your designs? Yeah, yeah. Is that because you know how to use alphas effectively, right? Yeah, yeah. Or like you, you have your alpha pack that you bought maybe t- five years ago and you figured out it works. Yeah. So you just put it on the, all the same things. Can you make the, I mean, I know I said uh, before I was like, I don't want to talk too much about Kitbash, but can you make your sci-fi designs without implementing shit tons of Kitbash, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It's all the same thing. It's about like, yeah, 
understanding your own strengths and weaknesses i think by kind of openly confronting these things and knowing like where you fall down in certain programs and how tools affect you and affect your mindset you're going to improve quite dramatically i think actually and and this can be extended to 2d as well you know yeah. like photo bashing has different a very definite look to photo bashing painting has a look to painting and if you rely too much on painting and you're not incredibly good at painting yeah. you're going to look painterly you know if you rely too much on photo bashing and and you don't know how to paint then you're going to have limitations to the pictures you find you yeah. know uh, if you don't know how to adjust lighting yeah with you'll be limited stroke, to yeah yeah you'll be limited to ambient light sources because the most common photo stuff that you find yeah or like you'll be limited to your like main for like lighting reference that you find yeah which not might not be the worst thing, so, but yeah. So I guess <laughs> you want to follow the reference yeah. and you find it. it so all, all these boils down to maybe thinking what you're gonna do if you can before you do it. Yeah. And choosing your tools carefully. Also putting yourself in question sometimes if you become too proficient with a tool, then maybe like oh maybe I should try this. I should try this experience. And. Use the tools, don't let the tools use you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very similar conversation, I suppose, to a lot of what we've spoken about with like AI, which is like the one of the reasons that I think many of us have like a big problem with AI as a act like real world use case is that you're not making design choices using yeah. AI. Just because you type in white robot with glass dome on the top, you're not making any of the millions of design choices mm-hmm. that come along with that. No matter how many iterations you do, you're still not actively engaged in that process. Yeah. Um and that is obviously, of course, the inherent problem with AI at the moment is like, even if you plan out exactly what you want beforehand, you're then not going to get it because it's not a good enough predictive model to yeah. get that done. I was wondering, like, what if someone has a certain style, like all they've done is like these models in in Blender that have a bl- very Blender look or like in um, gra- gra- cult, 3D cult, right? Yeah. What if they just, that's what they do, they're really good for at that, and maybe they even get hired to do that. More good for them, well, they're good for them. Yeah. But the, that, that's not what I, I think a good artist is, to be honest. Like, I think personally a good artist has a, ver- like... Maybe not good artist, film, but artist. A, a well-rounded artist, you know? Like a- <laughs> yeah, I guess, like, I, I think for me, like, just to talk more generally about what an artist is, but to me an artist is somebody who is uh, willing to explore visual Uh, mediums right Mm -hmm. like somebody who wants to tell a story to create a design but is willing to do it through whatever kind of process they can there's loads of great artists that only use one program but again i don't think those people i don't think they're great because they use the program i think they're great because of all of the other things that they are Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so yeah if somebody can only do 3d code stuff and like maybe it all looks like 3d code stuff where like the second you see it you go ah 3d code then i would say like that person, in my opinion, if they want to really extend their skills, does need to branch out, or at least needs to branch out in terms of how they use that program, maybe. Yeah, so um, like finding, des- starting with designs first, and yeah, then yeah, make I, something a bit more original, yeah. not so guided by 3D code. But also, you know, if someone only uses 3D codes, maybe they're just, and, and they go for that style, they probably also have the skills to go for another style with the same software. That's what I'm saying, so it's, like it's, the, yeah, it's the non-software stuff yeah. that makes them a great artist, yeah, not yeah. the software itself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we certainly know a few people who are like use certain softwares, but are yeah. incredibly good because they they can they understand sketch, the software you know, properly. They, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and they also know how to do their shit. Like they they use the software how they want. Yes. Yeah. Cool. You're the artist, baby. You gotta tell. You're making the art. You should be in control of what's going on. You yeah. shouldn't let external factors pressure you. Even if you were talking about like ZBrush and creatures earlier, right? Like. If you're in ZBrush and you don't know how to do like uh, drag out wings and stuff and like use alphas to create effective texturing across stuff and you're like, well, all of my character, all of my creature designs are smooth skinned aliens. Mm. Like, why? And like, you know, well, because I like it like that. Is it because you like it like that or because you don't know how to do textures? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's kind of what I mean is like you don't want a look to develop because of your inadequacy. I guess this can also be fixed by just painting over it. Uh- yeah, but also <laughs> hunting to learn new things. Mm. Like, I I really try, if I do a new project, I really try usually to challenge myself and be like, okay, bat, done. Monkey, done. What about a furry monster, you know? And then it's like, furry monsters is also a creature, but very different from monkey, you know? And like, yeah. all the techniques I'm going to use, maybe the base is the same, but to get to a good result, I'm going to have to learn new things. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. On that note, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, progress bars because when you do a render in 3D software, it has a progress bar. Okay. And that <laughs> and and you know how long that progress takes because it tells you. But how about progress in art? When you paint and learn how to do art, like how long does it take to actually progress? See what I'm saying? Good transition. Give that a seven and point five. Yeah. Hey, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking about it. It's just like, <laughs> I think twenty minutes. You were like, "Fuck, fuck, fuck! I need to find one." I think it's a very valid question. To be honest, I, I, I think, uh, at least the way that I would think about that is not so much about like objective progress, but perceived progress. Ninety nine percent of the time, you are making progress if you're just making art every day. I think that's one of the realities that sometimes people almost struggle to admit to themselves. It's like if you're making art, you're probably improving. Mm. You might not be improving a lot, but you're certainly improving somewhat, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the more yeah the more relevant thing almost which I, I feel like is probably what you were asking anyway is like how do we perceive our own success and improvement and how quick is it for us to see that stuff and to see the the, the gains that we're making essentially right yeah so um, I guess, yeah how long does it take progress to see progress well I, f- I think as as a big disclaimer is like everyone is different you know like someone is gonna be able to get better very fast and someone is going to struggle for a long time before seeing different results. It's, it, it all boils down to how you learn. Um, so it, you just, yeah, how you learn university yeah. courses, mentorship, whatever. Um, and also some people, they just, you know, I think talent's built do- different. Yeah. Talent doesn't make a good artist, right? I don't but think talent ta- exists. I don't, I don't think it's real, man. You don't think talent is real? Caveat about talent? Whole, whole, I think, whole episode. I think, All right, I, th- yeah, I, th- I, mean, I think talent is, is definitely step up at a start. But someone who has talent and doesn't work doesn't, never gets good. Talent is just external stimuli that develop inside a human being. Like, well, see, for example, I don't think there's many, many artists who are like, I worked at this company at this age. When I was 12 years old, I could already paint. Yeah, but, like, yeah, but that's not so, talent. That's no, not what I'm talking about. But, well, okay, isn't it? Isn't that, no. That's how most people understand talent. So for, is for like, me, the thing of talent is like, let's say someone goes to the gym and yeah. has great genetics. Sure. He's going to gain muscles very quickly. Yeah. Right? So that's almost, just tal- that's talent to me. It's like, it's like the ability to maybe, you, your brain allows you to maybe see designs in 3D faster or maybe your brain allows you to compute faster with certain tasks or you just learn faster or you just uh, have a better taste overall. Uh, I think that's you know, generally it's like, it's like do... picking up things faster, yeah. being a fast learner, or you know, just it's almost like having a better taste. <laughs> you know what I <laughs> yeah, mean? Yeah, I, I, but I don't think, I mean, at least for me, I don't think these are like things that people are born with personally. I, I think that it's usually to do with like that's your true. education, yeah. like D- definitely what yeah. happened to you when you were a kid, how did your parents raise you, how much food did you get growing up, mm. uh, you know, all these random like mini factors, and then around 10 to 12 years old children start exhibiting specific skills and people go oh your kid's so talented at blah 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 Mm -hmm. and then it just becomes this like mythos of like oh this child was born that way but really it's just like many random encounters and things specifically happened to build them that way yeah i'm i'm not sure i I feel like some kids might just let's get a neuroscientist yeah 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 yeah. the only only talent i would agree exists is like when those people like something happens to them, something traumatic, and then they have like a photographic memory or something. Like, <laughs> and they like, they can well, like... Spider-Man guys. <laughs> not, I don't know, like they can like fly over a city, like close their eyes and they remember like every building in a city. Like, yeah, that's probably a talent, you know. I yeah, I suppose. I, I'm sure it's there must be... What I'm saying, like it's a skill that you didn't have and then like from one day to another you have it. Like, sure, 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 sure. I mean, you, some people could try... Could do could put could put in the same efforts into something. Yeah, with the same starting point. Yeah, and some people are going to end up way better than the others. Yeah, I agree. You know. Yeah, but again, I still think that's to do with how they were stimuli. Yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like if you, like I was saying a bit earlier, mm-hmm. before you so rudely interrupted me. <laughs> if you're really young and you join a really good company, you're like you're like I'm ten years old and I worked at Character or whatever. Like often the reason that the ten year old works at Character is not because they're some super genius who's better than you. It's because they were exposed to the correct things in the correct order by pure luck and they also worked hard. I think it's a really damaging thing sometimes to think about like, you know, I remember growing up and uh, like seeing like, you know, when Finian McManus joined the island at like mm. 18 
And then I was like, oh, when I'm 18, I'm going to do that. And actually, it was a little bit like emotionally damaging to see that when I got to 18, I wasn't at ILM in a way because I had put that like expectation on myself. I felt like a massive fucking failure. But the reality was somebody like him, I'm sure if, uh, if you spoke to him about these things, you listened to his interviews, you know, like he had more exposure to the industry from a younger age. Like I didn't even really understand what it was until I was in my 20s. Mm-hmm. So to say that like I still I think I worked extremely hard throughout my like teenage years to become like as good an artist as I could be but without the exposure to specific things there was no hope of me ever getting as good as him at such a young age right Mm -hmm. um or maybe he's just built different I don't know but (laughs) yeah I I agree on that argument as well Daniel was saying that like this is certainly exposure to I mean I saw saw it with one of my friends who used to be my flatmate in university like he he growing up as a kid that you know they didn't have much and like he was he had to literally learn how to play with like almost trash you know like like find uh, like pieces of mm. um you know things you'd find maybe lay lay on the ground or like maybe in materials and they would learn how to build things out of that as a kid like and so so he was like very crafty as a kid already like learning how to build like small models and stuff like that or like maybe not trash but maybe they have like some woodworking and something you know, because like it's cheap like mm-hmm. find a piece of stick or something and you learn how to like mold it into something so like as a kid that 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 and you know believe it or not i mean like he was the guy who like i was he was the first person i met that was like wow this guy actually knows how to create things and come up with ideas you know he was the guy who had imagination what i would call and it's something that he he was exposed to as a kid and he never even thought that oh i've been creating my imagination now that's the thing is that doing you don't control any of that as a kid while growing up. Like, yeah, by, I agree. Yeah. By, the time, <laughs> by the time it's is the time to call it talent, let's say, yeah, it's there or it's not, right? So not yeah, by I, that time. You can, you can still just, expose some yourself. people have clear advantage compared to others. Yeah, I think I, I, I think for because I think it's important to say that not everyone is equal. Sadly, yeah, especially when you like 15, 16 or even later. But in order to become a good contractist, I think. Anyone who works hard enough can become conspirators. Yeah, but I, th- I think that's the healthy thing to remember. Yeah. It's like, but I, like I was saying, like, I don't think it's healthy to really, I never really like thinking or talking about talent, quote unquote, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I think it's very unhelpful. Oh, yeah. The, the, the sentence you're so talented, I think, is so stupid and so bad to say. Like, definitely. But, you know, at the same time, we're not all equal, sadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, what was the original question? How, how long <laughs> does it take to see progress? You know, and I think. It does depend on a person and on the individual, like whether they might improve okay, better. Okay, how how long but, did yeah. it go from you guys from first some like reach it like somebody pretty much like first you were first exposed to like real concept art to getting into the industry? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, what was the time frame for you guys? I, I can look it up. <laughs> what do you mean you have to look it up? Sure, you remember? <laughs> You're not that old, man. <laughs> I got I got exposed to concept art fairly when I was very young because I yeah. was really outgoing into because I knew I wanted to do something with art so um, probably was exposed to concept art when I was 12 whoa no maybe no not 12 14 14 probably yeah and then I just carried on my education without really trying anything about concept art not really worrying about it just be like oh in the future I want to do that but not doing anything specific except maybe doing some you know doing some art because I liked it and I think this carried on until probably university where I would be, I would, I would kind of follow the world. I would go to the events and that kind, of, that kind of stuff. But I would never, I never really worked actively, uh, because I felt like I had so much time left, yeah, yeah, yeah. and also because I felt like university would teach me, <laughs> 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 lol. Uh, and because I was, ah, oh, I'm gonna learn so much when it's time for me to learn. And also because the studies I was doing didn't really allow me to have time to do other stuff. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think after university. How how long, Jules? How many years? From what? From hearing about concept? From from when you started taking it seriously? How seriously? Long it yeah, seriously. How long did it take? Well, I, I guess start of university, and uh, so like three, four years. Yeah, uh, so for five years for me. I just looked it up. First time I heard about concept art when I was still doing like comic book sketching. I went to an art convention or something. Um, and then I met a guy and he kind of like just messaged yeah. me about it. He said like, check out Feng Zhu. And that was the first time I got it. And I, I took it pretty seriously within a year of like learning about it already because I was already quite serious about art. Yeah. So I think about five years. 
Well, then I, to get a job. Th- then mine could be even eight years, you know. But because I was following the event seriously, I wanted to do that. But at the same time, I was like, I'm just a kid, <laughs> so I'm not going to try. I yet. I would say like around 15 to 16, I was exposed to like the idea of being able to work mm. in films and games. But I didn't really. I can't honestly say that. I, so I was like practicing towards this goal and I saw like some concept art yeah. and I saw like stuff, but I never really understood what it was. And I wasn't until I was 21 that I actually met a concept artist. Mm, yeah. um, and then from that, it was, maybe it was 20, I don't know. It was it was two years after that, that it took me to get into the industry. But I had built up to say, like, if you look at my work, like I think it's a, if you, you can scroll down my Instagram and see everything I've done since I was like 16 years old. I think between the two years of like, uh 2020 to 2022 no it would have been 2019 to 2021 there's a pretty dramatic improvement where like i really Mm. like massively improved yeah um but by the same token i had also spent my like my parents were incredibly encouraging and i had built up many years of art skills art skills yeah yeah. it's just that i never uh synthesized them all together to build something real out it's it's quite hard to tell you know because for example i got my first bamboo wacom probably at 15 Mm. you know Uh, but you know and i was like oh concept art is cool but it, you know it's yeah it's hard to tell yeah it's either like 10 years or <laughs> and how long did it take you to see progress <laughs> <laughs> so i mean instantly because when you're 15 you're so shit that's funny because I, yeah. I don't really ever feel like uh, i i think like progress is very much guided by your eye so if your eye your eye usually improves faster than your actual technical skills and so for me i've always actually felt I maybe I can only remember like maybe a month in my life where I felt like I was good and then the rest of the time like even now I look at my art and I see many 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 problems in it mm. um by I, I think it's because I just spend a lot of time actively looking at my own work and trying to analyze what's wrong with it and so like I do see improvement and I saw the most improvement when I was a student and I had to go through that like big growth spurt where I was working loads of hours and like, I suddenly was like, okay, this is actually what I need to directly do. So that's where I saw like massive improvement. But even then, I remember like periods of like six months where I felt like I wasn't improving at all. Yeah. I was, but because my eye was advancing much faster than my hand, but I always felt like I was behind. It's also because at that age, like you might be doing sports, you might be learning music, you still have to go to school. Yeah. Like sometime, I, I'm sure sometime in your life, you haven't done art in like, I don't know, three months. No, never. Never? Never. But I mean, what, sure, do, I, what, sure. what, what, what do you mean by doing art? Is it like sketching while while you are? I once got in trouble in maths class. Okay, yeah, I, okay, then me too. I'm would, talking like art, art, like taking the time and like learning stuff, not just drawing on a pa- piece of paper. But that is art. Yeah, I don't, yeah, but that, that is, is that li- art that makes you get better. Yeah, yeah. L- l- yeah. Drawing, doing maths. Yeah, I I covered my whole maths table in sketches once. Yeah. My teacher got very angry. Yeah, yeah. Um, he didn't like that. <laughs> Kids, don't draw over your tables. No, do it and get better. <laughs> I wanna, I wanna kind of bring it back to the original, like where this idea came from, and it came just quickly. It came from um, the the course that I've been doing with Ryan Fair, mm-hmm. um, and when I started the course, uh, so it's been it was essentially like twelve week course. It was supposed to be a ten week course, but it went over longer because there was a break uh like there were two one week breaks in the course uh but i mostly still try to do work during that time and at the very beginning of the course i started sketching in my sketchbook um and i really forced myself to do it because i always wanted to do it and uh it wasn't until week six when i actually started to see progress where i was like oh i can actually see that i'm better not only see but i know it because i can sketch things that I want to like sketch on the paper I don't know if that makes any sense but sometimes when you try to sketch you can't quite sketch the idea out of your head properly but I can see that I'm like getting closer and closer to that already after maybe like six weeks um yeah of like doing the course six seven weeks and so like I I I think probably that was like surprising to me because I remember in like week five I was like fuck I'm like I don't feel like I'm like learning like progressing or whatever and then maybe like by week seven I was like okay like I can see some some progress and I would even use a lot of these techniques at work as well and that's why like think that helped me so because I was like okay I'm, I'm doing it there I'm gonna do it here and like that way I could just like keep improving faster because I use my work work to like keep learning even more and using these techniques I think for sure as well when you're learning stuff like um hopefully you're not going to get offended by this, but 
prior to your course of run, you weren't that good at sketching. And you've improved yeah. pretty dramatically actually over the last 10 weeks, which is really awesome to see. Thanks, um, but I bet that now that you've got pretty good at it, yeah. it's going to plateau extremely hard yeah. because that's what happens is like when you're first learning something, it's really easy to see the big improvements because you're learning something for the first time. It's like when you play guitar and you go from, I can't play it at all to learning even a few chords and suddenly like, I can play like 90 songs with these four chords essentially. Um, but after that, then you kind of plateau really hard and it, it becomes a very difficult grind to improve past yeah. that point, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think as well, where like many people find the struggle is like either they haven't exposed themselves to new stimuli to help that growth cycle or they have actually got pretty good at something and they just like struggle to find those like micro improvements. Mm -hmm. It's like with painting now, like I've been trying to improve my painting for quite a long time now. I think I've got to a point, at least hopefully in my opinion, where I've got fairly proficient at painting over my 3D and like making nice painterly concepts, learning about brush efficiency, color usage, and all these other things that come with more painterly images. But now all of the things that I see that are wrong with my images are like, it's probably gonna take me like five to six years to fix them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like, okay, your brush efficiency is okay, but how do you get it from okay to really good like John Park? Mm. You know, a lot of practice is the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah definitely at the start you get, uh, it's, it's definitely like a straight line and you learn a lot, or maybe actually even a, a, a hyperbole that just goes, yeah. goes very fast, but then you plateau definitely for a while. And I think especially after being in industry for a while or doing the, the thing for a while, mm. it's more like it's less of a steady progression. It's more of a plateau connection Jump. in your brain yeah. or like tutorial or just a new pro like pushing yourself to learn something yeah. new and then jump plateau again, jump yeah. plateau again. I and find one of the things that really helps as well is like when you meet or have to be under the direction of a new artist. I think that always really helps because mm -hmm. you're having to learn the taste and the new things that come mm -hmm. along with that new person who's directing. Yeah, totally. Like, I feel after after uni, I really properly learned a lot and that was a huge jump. And then after that, I maybe it was maybe like small jumps over like a year. And then I, my first job, and that was another huge jump mm. because I got taught so much stuff by the artists I was working with. Mm -hmm. And after that, probably another plateau, but maybe each project a little jump, you know? And, but, it's hard to learn without the help of anyone else, I think. Yeah, totally. Or without following a course. If you're just left by yourself drawing again and again and again, at least for me, yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to improve too much or it's going to be no. I feel harder. like one of the kind of, ugh, this is a little bit of an extreme wording, but one of the great shames of being in the industry is that eventually you do reach a point where, especially when there's deadlines and stuff like that, people look at your work and they go, good enough. Mm -hmm. Because... Now, I mean, it's been a very long time since I did a keyframe or a painting or a design where somebody goes, oh, fuck no, Ugh, like that. It just doesn't happen that often because I understand all of the tools to make something look good. And I, I wish that actually there was, the, I guess, the capability, the time, the yeah. budget to allow you to push things and for the industry to be a little bit more critical overall. Because like everywhere I've worked, even like with freelance and stuff, it's the same. It's like you get something to a certain level, it gets pushed like another 1% just to put it more in line with whatever the client wants and then you're done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been so many designs where I've finished them. I've finished them, quote unquote, and I've just been sitting there like, fuck, I wish I could have done a lighting pass mm -hmm. on that. I wish I could have done more texturing. I wish I could have just pushed it at like 10% more to like make it really good because I know that I would learn so much from doing it. But is there budget for that? Nah. Is there time for it? Nah. I and guess so that's a, it. A, yeah. a, a way to maybe help that would be only to pick projects. I mean, in the future, if you do get the opportunity <laughs> to pick projects. We're, we're all, in, we're, we could all pick our projects, yeah, right? We're all right? very successful. I, I can pick to be unemployed if I want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but like in the, in the future, if you can pick projects uh, and you want to learn, hmm. maybe pick Pick projects where you feel like you're not good at it, you know, or like pick project that makes you stress. Put about. you in, a, put you out of your comfort yeah, zone. Yeah, yeah. Like if if you're great at sci-fi, maybe just as, maybe I don't know, do a medieval fantasy uh, creature or like some some very different to it. As long as you're enjoying it, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Of you course. Need to have fun. Yes. But, but also, I mean, if you want to learn and learning is an enjoyment, then yeah. you know. Yeah. I think even as well, like even if you are doing sci-fi and that's your thing, how do you push that even further? okay, like you can do a really cool prop gun, but like how unique are your prop guns? Can you do something that's like 
totally different to what anybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. That's pushing yourself, right? If you exist within a certain frame of reference and people understand your work to look a certain way, how can you challenge that, right? Um, so really, like, I guess, like, what, to, to bring it more back to what the original thing was, like, you're going to see more progress the more uncomfortable you are. The moment that you're feeling like... Shit, that's a very good point. Yeah. Like, yeah the the point. more that you're feeling like, I'm good, I'm fine, that's when you become complacent and that's when things just tend to stagnate. Hopefully you never feel comfortable. It's sad to say, but hopefully you yeah. always, if you want to always learn, if your goal is to learn, 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 learn. Always be in emotional pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but it's like, if it's it's uncomfortable because you're learning. If it's, it's comfortable yeah. because yeah. It's, a, it's a good feeling in that case, you know. But it doesn't mean like you're like, as you're painting, you're uncomfortable. Sometimes it's just that. <laughs> oh, this chair is already. <laughs> I, like to, I like to put a bed of nails on whatever I sit on. Sometimes it's just the like. Even with the sketching, I remember I was feeling like not very confident in doing it, you know. And I was feeling kind of like every time I, I looked at my sketch, it was like shit. Like, like you know, I'm not very good at it, but I have to do it. Uh, but when I started doing it during the time that I was doing it, uh, it was fun. Um, but then I stopped, and then every now, ever when, when I had to get back to it, I was like, oh fuck, this feels like such a task to tackle, and I should just like do what I already know. Um, but I think, the great thing about it is that eventually you go back to it, and you go, oh, yeah. it's a, it's not that bad now. Yeah, yeah. And also, that, by, by the way, I'm very impressed that Stefan has not made a single gym analogy during yeah. this whole conversation. Well done, buddy. This what? is. But all, all, also, <laughs> I've been going to the gym less. <laughs> If if it's your choice, like if if you're like I don't want to do it, but I'm gonna do it, you know, yeah. then it makes it easier. To, you know, no one is forcing you. You're like, you know what? I don't feel like sketching now, but I'm gonna still sketch. Yeah. Then you're there. You do it, and once you start doing it, uh, yeah. I think that's just like mental fortitude. You know, it's like it. it I'll do the gym analogy. It's a little bit like knowing that you're unfit and waking up and going to the gym mm, anyway. Yeah. Even yeah. though it's uncomfortable, even when it's cold and you don't want to do it. It's, you know, it's eating your vegetables. It's all of those fucking analogies. It feels awful, but when you're done, you're happy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's, yeah, understanding what your priorities are. I don't think everything... I, I do dislike some of those people on YouTube who are like, I wake up, I eat ice, I sit in the ice, I stab my veins with tiny needles, and then I'm ready to invest in the stock market. I invest in the most dangerous stocks, and then, blah, 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 you know, and they're just like, my life is pain, and yours should be too. It's like, no, you like you should have comforts in your life. You should have things that are easy and things that are difficult. I mm -hmm. think it's important to choose what you want to be difficult, because there's only so much energy you have as a person, right, to expend. If it's going to be if you like if you want to get fit and you know that you have to get fit and that is the most important thing for you you need to expend more of your energy and effort into doing that than mm -hmm. into anything else if your main thing is hey i need to get really good at art you need to redistribute your energy to prioritize that it's yeah. like in star trek where it, they're like put the energy into the photon cannons in the, in like the, yeah, in the shield and yeah exactly it, it's you are a star trek ship <laughs> <laughs> put you it know. on a t-shirt <laughs> efforts brings to uh, some results, right? I guess you, yeah. if, if you don't do anything, nothing is going to happen. Very I, I don't poignant. Th yeah. Indeed. But I think what Dan was talking about is just like, yeah, you have, yeah, it's, there's a limited amount of choices that you make that can feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They can like keep doing uh, mm -hmm. throughout the day. So it's just like, Keep it, keep it to a place where you're still happy. You That's know? ultimately what leads to burnout, right? Is when yeah, oh, you have oh, too yeah, many sure. uncomfortable things happening all at once and you're just burning too much power in your brain, you're yeah. overclocking and then you're done. Then so guys, yeah. what's your personal way to that see... Was, that was not... Give us a caveat, come on. Come no, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not transition. It's a finalized uh, for this thing. Uh, so uh, how do you... <laughs> well, you, you guys just bring expectation, you know? <laughs> Bad expectation. So, so how do you what's your technique to see your own progress how do you assess your own progress Stefan oh what about me yeah well, yeah after you all right after me and you'll have a very interesting Thanks. way <laughs> mine is um I spend more time looking at my art than other people's which is serious I I really do I always I nearly always I bet if you looked at the art station pages I open the most it's my portfolio mm. not because I think I'm hot shit or because I'm like oh I don't like bask in my own glory and go like wow that's oh that's good no I'm looking at it critically I look at all of my work on a regular basis I look at my five most recent projects on a regular basis and I really look at them and I think to myself is this good enough how can it be better what am I doing wrong yeah. and I think by that's how I see the improvement 
because then being so aware of what I'm doing and being having like so much more an analysis of what I've actually done in the past, that's how I'm able to see that I've gotten better at something. Um, yeah. Uh, that's quite actually cool because I don't I don't like to look at my old work that much <laughs> um, for the reason that I like to have a good memory of a painting and I try not to and every now and then I look at it and I'm like oh fuck this could be better mm. and that could be better and uh, maybe I anyway it'd be, maybe it's something that I may should, should start doing more uh, certainly could help to be aware of it the way I track my progress is to just uh, tackle the 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 things that are come difficult to me so mm-hmm. uh like the sketching and stuff and and generally because i'm like tackling certain fundamentals and I'm, and working on them al- alongside my actual work work um then i can kind of see the progress pretty quickly i guess mm-hmm. just be like oh i can do more complicated image now oh my sketches look better oh my thumbnails are more interesting because i've kind of like tackled these fundamentals uh, so that's kind of how I mm-hmm. track my progress is through the amount of fundamentals that I've been yeah. tackling recently. Yeah. For me, it's pretty similar to Dan. I think I there's two ways I, I where I usually can notice I progressed is I look back at my older work and it's almost like new things appear, or like new mistakes appear, you know. And also looking a lot of your own at your own work, I think it's not necessarily as a bad thing or as a good thing. Just you know being just open to criticize yourself like just mm-hmm. imagine it's someone else's artwork or maybe the new thing you learn try to critique your work with the new thing you learned so I think that's a good yeah. way to see your progression and also something else which is not something I don't necessarily do uh, purposely but I will notice when I improved a lot when I look at other people's work mm-hmm. or other people's work that used to impress me a lot and I look at it and it there's oh, no more good, yeah, there's no more point, like yeah. magic I mean it's still amazing work right but they would it, I would not, it's completely demystified. It does there's, shrink down there, there, the there, amount of people that you look up. There's there, there's no more like, wow, this is so impressive. I wonder how this is even possible to be made. Now it's like, this looks amazing and I know exactly how it's made. Mm. Uh, and I think this is a, a good point to see that maybe not I've gotten better in silly, but I understand better how things are made. And, and maybe a good way to know where, to know what I still need to learn is look at work some people and if I get the wow effect or if I get the this mm. is magic for me then this means I don't know how to do it mm. you know like if I look at a full on painting by a master I'm like wow I'm really shit at painting yeah. because I don't know how this is made talking about um, people's this, what, no I, I got this for you I got this no for you. I got one no, no, oh, mine's better but all this work <laughs> you look at it on our station right and on social medias right and it's a very painful process to post your things or sometimes it feels good as well and that brings me to what do you guys think and what's your relationship with social media as a concept that? artist? Seven. That was a good one. I, wait, I, got, I feel like I got a... Uh, it's going to be the same, it's gonna the same no, thing. No, 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 no. All right. <sighs> Talking about how people react to your work, how do you guys relate with social media? See, oh, more, the same thing. succinct and to the point, that's, that's art right there. <laughs> <laughs> I give myself a nine. <laughs> And then you're going to look at it for like a few weeks and yeah, you're like, yeah. that's a two fuck. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so social media. Yeah, I feel like especially because of, I mean, we're doing a podcast here, which is quite ironic to talk about social media as doing a podcast. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. But I guess we have different layers of social medias. We we do the event, where we do, um, which has our social media involved. We do personal work, which has our social media involved. And how do you think this is important in a career Mm -hmm. and do you like it or do you hate it and yeah whatsoever well i think i generally like social media because it's how i've met so many of my friends it's a great way to interact with people it's wonderful to see other people's work and to be inspired by it but i also think there is this like terrible kind of beastie behind it which is not only like how do these things emotionally affect you and how do you feel about like your following and how many people like your work and all this other stuff. But also the reality of like, especially for younger artists like ourselves and pretty much anybody who hasn't had like 10 plus years of experience in the industry, your career could be made or broken with your social media presence pretty much. Mm -hmm. If you're a really good artist, you could, but nobody knows who you are, you could go and work at a totally like mid-tier company, right? Even if you're, 
double, triple A quality work artist. Because if the work isn't put in front of people, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think like, it's kind of this thing that people don't like to talk about where they're like, you know, it's all about the quality of the work. It's a meritocracy, but it's also about who gets to see your work. Mm -hmm. It's also about having enough presence that people, when someone, let's say you're in a meet, that someone's in a hiring meeting with a bunch of artists and they say, oh, Jules Derulia applied to our company, that one of them goes, I know that guy, he's pretty good, you know, rather than everyone sitting there silently. Mm -hmm. Because one artist saying, I know that guy, he's pretty good, could literally be the thing that gets you hired over somebody else who nobody knows. Yeah, or, you know, even like, if I hear about an artist I never heard about, and I was like, oh yeah, check on Instagram. And then I open Instagram, I'm like, oh yeah, I follow him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an instant. It's a plus one. Yeah. It's like an instant, oh yeah, I follow him because I've seen his work and it's good, you know. Um, I don't think social media is the most important thing. Definitely not. I think like uh, in, in real life, networking and that kind of stuff is important. But at the same time, networking is a lot online. Of social you know? media, yeah. yeah. Of social media. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a weird relationship. It's like it's like it's almost like homework. It's like oh, I have to do my homework. I have to post work, <laughs> you know, because maybe you're just not as egotistical as me. Like I I'm quite hyped whenever I post stuff online. I'm oh, like, I, oh, I I like got, I get to show everybody what I've been up to. I mean, <laughs> yeah, true, but no, I like it as well. Like yeah, it. If it does feel good, but at the same time, you know, I'd rather not have to think about this. You know, I'd rather not have to, because it brings a lot of compare, comparing yourself with others. It brings a lot of what if people don't like this work or, or, oh, this piece is not as good as my previous piece or, or all these questions, which like, I think we probably would be happier without having to worry about this, you know? Yeah. But I think as a professional, no matter what, these are probably things, let's say that Instagram didn't exist. You'd mm -hmm. probably still be thinking about this stuff, right? It's just like, cause it's just that you yeah. wouldn't be able to see everybody's stuff. I think that's the thing is that it's, it becomes... 30 years ago, or maybe even longer now, 40 years ago, we're talking about like you would compare yourself with the people if you lived in LA, in LA, right? Mm. You compare yourself to the artists you knew. Now you have access to every single artist, which means that the quality standard has like enormously risen. And I mm. think the ability to learn and see what's out there has enormously risen. But yeah, the, the ability to self-criticize and put yourself down because I'm not as good as the 10 year old from Argentina who mm -hmm. can photo bash better than me or whatever. Like that's definitely way more prevalent uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, and this is, I don't know if we're talking just in general social media as well and just like growing your social media as well or- Yeah, just how you feel about it. Okay. Like and, and Just what, vibes, dude. Yeah, I feel, <laughs> I, I, I feel like- Also about, you know, social media linked to concept art, I guess. Because like growing your social media is definitely a thing you can invest into time and effort. Even you can even grow social media without like doing particularly concept arty, like something that would be specifically related to concept art, yeah. meaning that you make short videos. Yeah, you can make short videos of like snippets of like, even you might not even be the best concept artist, but you can like once you reach a certain level of uh, art, uh, people will like, if you market yourself pretty well enough, you can you can get tons of tons of followers. You might not even have to be the best artist, but because now you have tons of tons of followers, like studios might reach out to you because they know that all these followers that love your work will you know be happy when you work on their project. You know, I mean, it's difficult to be that kind of. Not everyone has that kind of you know gravity to for a company to be like we want you because of your following but there are people like that you mm -hmm. know that have like hundreds of thousands of followers you know it's insane but i i yeah. think it's like an underspoken thing about because we love to i think people in art love to see art as a meritocracy which is a wonderful kind of goal to have but ultimately like there are many things that we've spoken about before that separate one person from another whether it's their opportunities or you know their income mm -hmm. or blah 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 but for sure, social media is a thing that separates people. If everybody knows who you are, then everybody also includes hiring. It includes art directors. Mm -hmm. It includes actual directors. It includes game devs, whatever. And, you know, I've definitely got job offers through Instagram. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and I've got job offers through ArtStation and all these different yeah. places. And it's good, to, I think, to remember that, like, at the end of the day, we live in... A kind Society. of time, and, yeah, but it also in a highly globalized time and place where you are in competition with many people from all around the world. And it's just important to remember to put yourself out there and to 
actually actively pursue these kind of things it's it's not a tool you have access to you know yeah. to, to to get your work out there and it's you know like it's not even necessarily about the amount of followers but let's say you have the, the right quality people. No, but yeah i mean <laughs> if, the, but if you do have the right course. people following you you know like some people have 200 followers but then you look at the flowers that they have or well, people liking their, their posts and it's like just insane artists from the industry yeah and they just have that's true yeah but just because i guess they have the contacts you know and so but they still post you know and they still and they probably have all the benefits they need from the from posting then and also i think social media is not fair as well you know um, oh yeah the algorithm is random yeah and it's, it's a cruel god yeah <laughs> <laughs> We need to do the, the dance for the likes. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's really unfair. And I don't think the likes really necessarily, uh, you know, if, if you do great work and you don't have that many likes, I, I don't think it's worth feeling bad about it. Like, it's good to know, it's, it's good to separate yourself with yeah. social media bits and just, see, just maybe see it more as another work tool, you know, and that's it. Rather, uh, than, rather than your artistic value. I try to see it as like, it's my gallery space. It's mm. where I, I am like, if I was a fine artist and I was putting up gallery shows, like mm. this is where I'm doing the same thing. I'm showing people what I've been working on, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully like, I guess, ultimately creating things that like inspire people and engage them and that they enjoy looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it can easily become uh, something that people become a bit obsessed with and they're like, I'm going to do this project specifically to get followers mm-hmm. or like, I don't really like fan art, but I'm going to start doing it because it gets brings in a lot of likes and shit like this. And I don't think you want to be going down that kind of rabbit hole if you want to improve as an artist and improve mm-hmm. in your career. But yeah, like making projects maybe more than once every three years so that you have something to post online and show people what you've been up to and your skill set and all this other stuff is a really good idea. Mm-hmm. Definitely keeps you, keeps to help you, helps to keep you Motivated. relevant mm-hmm. uh, in the industry. Uh, so people are still aware um, that you are there, that you are working. Things. <laughs> like because sometimes you don't have projects it's to true, show yeah. for many, many months. And I mean, I, I, I think out of the three of us, I haven't had the opportunity to show any of my work at all anywhere. And I still don't. I've and only got to show one thing. Yep, but it's more than nothing. Jules had the most. Yeah, I've, I've been able to show a lot. Um, but still, not that much compared to the amount of work, but a lot compared to you guys. Huh? Not that much, but still not that much compared to the amount of work I did on some oh, shows. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. But maybe that's inherent. I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why I essentially try to do mm-hmm. personal work to keep you keep you on there, you know? Yeah, yeah personal work is important. Uh, it's it's just good to let people know your current level, you know, because yeah. especially when you, I mean, I think at all time it's just good because you, you should always work be improving. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and being able to show that, oh, look, in between those two posts, or like if you scroll down to my Instagram, I just got so much better. It also shows that, yeah, it's getting better. Yeah, I think as well, it's something to talk about like how different social medias are used. For example, like how do you use ArtStation versus Instagram versus LinkedIn? Because for a professional career, I think the most important one to be on top of is actually probably LinkedIn because there's a very low bar to reaching the right people on LinkedIn, right? You have your network and it automatically goes out to everybody in your network. And for example, like uh, Ben Proctor, who's the art director, sorry, the production designer from Avatar 2 and 3, he doesn't follow me on Instagram, but I'm connected with him on LinkedIn. So if I post my work onto LinkedIn, then people like Ben Proctor, who ultimately probably don't really have any fucking interest in me or who I am, will still be able to see my work and be exposed mm-hmm. to it, which might then inspire them to be interested in it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's a really good reason to use that program, like program, I mean, tool, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. social media. Instagram is great because it builds up a more casual community and like fan base around yourself. So that's where people can interact with you a bit more. You can show like more casual stuff on your stories. You can post like more sketchy things if that's the kind of vibe you have. And then ArtStation is your portfolio where you keep like the best stuff. Like if somebody says, I want to hire you, you send them the ArtStation account, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Because that's where all of the coolest things that you've done are going to be seen. Mm -hmm. Um, and each of those comes with like differing levels of coordination, curation, different types of like results that you're hoping for from these things. I think it's good to think about them in that way mm-hmm. rather than just like uh, com- completely committing to one thing because one yeah. thing will only get you one result. Yeah. Right. And and those, are, those don't 
have an intrinsic value of you as a person. Yeah. It's a... Uh, Actually, know, I do. I judge everybody by how many Instagram followers they yeah, have. Yeah. So if you're um, sub 10,000, <laughs> I don't like you. That's why I don't like myself. We all shit. <laughs> yeah, we're Fuck, all shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's probably hard to differentiate yourself from social media too much or not to to have too much of a fixation on it. But I think it's very important. It's very, very important yeah. for mental health and just for yourself, you know? Like, Dude, I mean, John yeah. Park recently quit Instagram, right? Did he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he was taking a break. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. I've seen that, yeah. After, he posted like two insanely good things. <laughs> yeah. This painting was so good. And he's like, oh, I'm stopping. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Leave you on a high note. I, yeah, I think yeah. he, he always seems like a, I think he had, took a break before from Instagram as well. He seems Maybe. like a person that just like, because he has so many likes, you know, he must. I, I guess it must get to you. To once, you're, once you're like that famous, it yeah. gets to you. And it's only like, got um, 2,000 K likes. Yeah. I mean, it's like, if you look at like someone like Jamie Jones, who I think most people know who he is, or Craig Mullins, go look at their portfolio websites and just consider the amount of work there for the amount of time that they've worked. Like Jamie Jones has like 20 images on yeah, his page yeah. and he's been working for like over 20 years. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's quite a, that's a Chad move to just post like, here's the 20 best things I've worked on and you, I literally won't show you anything else. <laughs> but I, and for that to be okay, because everyone's like, well, this guy's fucking great. Also, social media is a good way to to show yourself as you want to be perceived. But if you want to do vehicle design only and you don't want to do anything else, then, you know, social media is the best place or your portfolio or whatever to really make this go through, you know, to really yeah. communicate that. If you don't want to do creatures, then don't show creatures. I think that's a great point because, yeah, people often, I've, I've spoken to people who get pigeonholed into certain things because they did, for example, one gun project mm-hmm. and then they so keep likes. getting hired for gun projects yeah. and then what are they posting? Well, gun projects because they just worked on this gun project mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. suddenly they're a gun designer and you talk to them and they're like, I never, I, I wanted to do animals. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it can definitely happen. So you have to be aware of the kind of overall visual image you're giving off of yourself um, I wouldn't like, you know, overthink it by the same token. But yeah, be aware of like what you're putting out there. If you like uh, Richard Anderson, right, is a guy who I think, at least from my minimal conversations with him, generally seems to like to do sketching. Mm-hmm. And although he does a lot of other work, uh, like he can definitely do like photo real stuff. Mm-hmm. You don't see much of that on his social media because what does he like to do? Sketching. So he wants to get hired for sketching. Totally. Yeah. I think also like I speaking from experience, I wanted to do more creatures. And I did one, I spent quite a lot of effort into it. And yeah. then my recent job, I got it thanks to this image I post on social media, yeah. right? So I did what I wanted what I wanted to do more in professional uh, context. Yeah. And thankfully, this image attracted the right people, which led to the current job I am. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. this is only thanks to social media. Yeah. Cool. Epic. Well, yeah. Uh, nice. That'll be the end for today's episode. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed listening. And if you want more, please feel free to subscribe to our social media. Please. Yes. Oh God, we need more yes. followers. Uh, Un- unlike what we just said, we're going to be very, very sad if we don't have them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you don't like this video, I'm crying. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the value of the likes of this video is directly linked to our how, self-worth. How, yeah, our yeah. worth. And our happiness. Yeah. So make sure that you ring the notification bell. <laughs> we release episodes every two weeks. And if you want any more additional information about the podcast or the event that we run, be sure to check out our Instagram linked in the description below. Thanks again. And we'll see you all soon. Bye. You. Bye-bye. Take see care. You. Bye.